So when I was growing up, my dad told me that there were a few moments in his young life that were formative for him, and he could never forget where he was when those events happened. There were some that were personal events, but there were also big cultural events. For him, there was the Beatles, the moon landing. But the biggest event, he once told me, was, what do you think? JFK, the assassination of JFK, yeah. It seems as though there are cultural events within each generation that almost define that generation. I remember the event that seemingly defined my generation. It happened during my senior year of college. I woke up late that later than my roommates on that September day in 2001. When I walked to the living room of my apartment, they were sitting with, uh, their, in our chairs with blank faces and their eyes glued to the television screen. Something was definitely different about this morning, and when I asked, hey guys, what's going on, they totally ignored me, and soon my eyes were glued to the television too. Everyone on campus that day was numb. We went to the student union and watched the events of that day unfold. The next day, the president of Winfield and the dean of students invited us to an open forum. The dean said that our generation would be known as the 9-11 generation. How could we forget that day? I couldn't forget it if I wanted to. But every year at around this time, people post on social media and hang banners and signs on the roads and bridges that say, we will never forget, or the alternative, we will always remember, as if we could ever forget what happened on 9-11. Those images are seared into our minds. The question, I don't think, is whether we remember what happened on 9-11. I think the more important question is, what can we learn about ourselves from 9-11? I think this is an important question because our culture clearly hasn't healed from those events. And we haven't healed in part because of the reaction to those horrific events. We got hit, and for the most part, American culture wanted a leader who would hit back. The Bush administration hit back with shock and awe. Do you remember this phrase? Shock and awe, which was meant to cause overwhelming destruction against our enemies so that they and nobody else would ever think about messing with the United States again. And I'll be honest with you, at that point in my life, I wanted to hit back. I got caught up in the cultural desire for revenge, only we called it justice. I thought that of course Saddam Hussein was involved, and of course he had weapons of mass destruction, and of course he was lying to us about them. I wasn't a fan of George W. Bush. I didn't vote for him, but I thought Colin Powell was trustworthy. So when he said Saddam had weapons of mass destruction, I believed him. And besides, it seemed that after 9-11, the United States was actually united and it felt good to belong to something bigger than myself in our culture. And I didn't realize it at the time, but that sense of unity and belonging came primarily by uniting against a common enemy. While it might feel good, it is spiritually toxic to find unity that way. It is not healthy, and it never leads to true healing. When I see signs and banners saying that we will never forget, I often wonder if we are just scratching at old wounds and so we will never really heal. Even worse, I wonder if many in our culture like scratching those wounds. Many of us like to remind ourselves of 9-11 to remind ourselves that we were victims on that day because it's as victims that we are able to unite against and kill enemies in the name of freedom justice, and peace. We claim that we are seeking freedom and justice and peace, but I often wonder if we are more honest 
if we'd admit that a large part of our response to 9-11 was actually revenge. And that's why we haven't healed. Of course, we in the United States are not alone in this response. When historians write their books, it's usually about wars. Tragically, it seems human history is filled with them. On a personal and national level, the human default position has often been, if you hit me, I get to hit you back. This creates a cycle of violence where everyone accuses the other of hitting first, and thus everyone claims that they are acting in self-defense. Is this reciprocal violence back and forth wise? We're not just talking about wars at this point. We're also talking about the way we talk with one another. There's such a hostility in our culture, and it's easy to absorb that hostility within ourselves. I must admit that I've done this more often than I'd like to admit. It's easy to respond to comments that I perceive as simple or foolish by being negative, dismissive, and rude. This rudeness and dismissiveness really can't be contained. When I start down the path with political opponents, it infects other areas of my life, such as my relationship with my wife and my other family members, my colleagues at work, and even my relationships here at church. In our passage today from Proverbs, we see that wisdom cries out to offer us a better way. Proverbs is personified as a divine woman. That's what wisdom is. Wisdom is the feminine aspect of God, and she cries out for us to resist the cultural aspects of violence and hostility. But this divine resistance isn't primarily against, about being against those we deem as our enemies. It's much more about us. Divine wisdom asks, how long will scoffers delight in their scoffing? And at this point, I realize that this is about me. I delight in my scoffing. I love it because I can build a whole sense of myself, a whole sense of identity by scoffing at others. Oh, how stupid that person is. How could anyone believe that? This makes me feel good about myself because it elevates me above others as I think that I'm right and the other person is wrong. But as Proverbs says, being right does not necessarily make one wise. It might just make our ego bigger. If our rightness depends upon scoffing at another or making another person wrong so that we can seem like we are right, then as Proverbs says, we will only bring calamity upon ourselves. The first Christians claimed that the wisdom of Christ seemed like foolishness to the world, to a world stuck in this exchanging of violence back and forth, a world that thinks might makes right. The way of Jesus is utter weakness and foolishness. This is why I find Jesus so fascinating. In our reading this morning, Jesus asks his disciples, who people say that he is. Some people thought he was John the Baptist come back to life. Others thought he might be a great prophet, Elijah, or maybe a different prophet from their past. And then Jesus asked his disciples, yes, but who do you say that I am? Peter, one of Jesus' closest disciples, said, you are the Messiah. The word Messiah means the anointed one. It was used as a title for someone who was anointed as king and savior of the people. Peter thought Jesus was the one he and his people had been waiting for for generations because the Jews were conquered by many empires. At the time of Jesus, they were under Roman rule and oppression, and the Jewish king at the time worked in collaboration with the Roman Empire. The king was viewed by the masses as a traitor. But without an alternative king to lead the people in rebellion, there was nothing they could do. So Peter called Jesus the Messiah, 
the anointed one who would save the people of Roman from Roman rule and the corrupt kings of Israel. Peter expected Jesus to bring the masses together and successfully lead a violent army of people against the enemies of Israel. But Jesus knew that war would not lead to healing. Before he was arrested, some of Jesus' disciples tried to protect him with swords, and Jesus scolded them by saying that he could bring an overwhelming force of angels to destroy Rome with shock and awe. But shock and awe is not the way of God. It only leads to more destruction. So Jesus resisted the powers of domination, not by adding more violence into the world. He resisted them through nonviolence. Jesus worked for justice by calling people out for their oppressive ways, to be sure. But he also called people in by healing and feeding and welcoming all people into the realm of God's love. And make no mistake, Jesus led a radical resistance movement. Jesus wasn't crucified simply because he taught people to love their enemies. Nobody would be crucified for that. He was crucified because he led this resistance movement. Indeed, it was a nonviolent resistance movement, but Jesus resisted the powers that thwarted the emergence of the kingdom of God. That's why he was killed. Jesus said no to the ways of violence, the ways of revenge. He said that if you want to follow him, you'd have to give up the desire to win, to scoff, to demean, and to dominate others. Wisdom cries out. And at one point in his life, Jesus became this wisdom, enacted this wisdom as he looked over the city of Jerusalem before he was murdered on the cross, and he wept. He cried out, saying, if you, Jerusalem, if you had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes because they choose violence. The rulers and even the people of Jerusalem missed an opportunity to recognize the things that make for peace. Peace is not simply the absence of conflict. Peace is justice for all people. The things that make for true peace were clearly shown in the ways of Jesus. The day Jesus was crucified was a day his followers would never forget. And as Jesus, the Messiah, as he ate with the Last Supper with his disciples, Jesus told them to always remember him and the life that he poured out. But they didn't remember in a way that led to retaliation against anyone. They remembered the cross as a symbol of God's radical love, forgiveness, and desire for a more just world. Jerusalem missed an opportunity for peace during Jesus' day, and the United States missed an opportunity for peace following 9-11 all those years ago. We continue to miss that opportunity for peace when we legislate policies that exclude or scapegoats immigrants, Muslims, and that lead to racial profiling. That is not the way of Jesus. And so wisdom continues to cry out today. And Jesus continues to come to us today and ask us an important question. Who do you say that I am? Like Peter, we might answer that Jesus is the Messiah. But Jesus is not the violent Messiah who came to kill our enemies. He is the nonviolent Messiah who calls us to rise up for justice while also participating in radical love that embraces all people, including our enemies. May we participate in that radical love. May we choose the way of peace through Christ. And may we follow Jesus no matter where he leads. Amen. Hi everyone, this is Adam Erickson reminding you that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome at Clackamas United Church of Christ. We are located at 15303 Southeast Webster Road in Milwaukee, Oregon. Our worship service starts at 1030 on Sundays, except for during the summer months, we start at 10 o'clock. If you'd like more information on our church, you can visit our Facebook page, 
or our website at c-ucc.org. You can also reach out to me through email at adam at c-ucc.org. Until next time, grace and peace be with you.